financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host, Shane and Kyle, as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast. I'm Shane and... I'm Kyle. Certainly glad you've decided to join us today. The Vani Podcast is covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except... It's a big except too. Except for governments and the agents thereof. And if you do access this material and we know about it, we will publicly shame you and put you on blast. So, yeah, you just don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Uh, but, yeah, you can learn more at bipcot.org. The title of this episode is Legal Interstices, Exempted from Tyranny, and the show notes can be found at vonniepodcast.com forward slash four. First off, if you haven't gone and checked out the website, please do. There's a lot of valuable information on there already, and more will be added in time. If you're going there now, just go ahead and pull up the, pull open the uh, definitions and terms list that Kyle so graciously put together. Some terms that we'll use may be relatively new, so at least consider having it open for, you know, a few episodes until, you know, you kind of get used to it. That said, in this episode, we'll be discussing Rayo's concept of legal interstices. In more detail, we'll figure out what the hell they are, what Rayo said about them, their benefits, and there are some, and uh, their drawbacks as well. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and get into it. And since, uh, Kyle, you wrote uh, an article on this subject, so, hell, I'll just let you define it. So, uh, what are legal interstices? Well, I guess you could say that uh, legal interstices, briefly defined, are gray areas within the law that can be used to violate the spirit of the law while simultaneously keeping the letter of the law. Uh, In other words, legal loopholes can be utilized to increase personal freedom, uh, to put it in more simple terms. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, uh, as you know, people who have read your Right to Travel series, uh, they're they're aware of a term called extra constitutional. And you know, I think this is kind of good to address. Uh, yeah, I think it's good to address. But uh, I guess let's compare and contrast, you know, extra constitutional versus legal interstices, because uh, I I I think I don't know. I in my in my opinion, I think extra constitu like the uh, extra constitutional acts by government could be, uh, you know. Essentially, the use of legal interstices, uh, not to advance personal freedom, but actually to, you know, use lawfare against the American citizens. So could you speak to that? Sure. Well, as, as I wrote in that other uh, series about the, uh, the right to travel, yeah, that which is extra constitutional is that which does not violate the letter of a uh, body of constitutional law but which would in fact violate the spirit of it or what originalists would call uh, original intent uh, particularly. So when we look at something like an action which is extra constitutional versus a legal interstice, well that kind of gets very interesting right in terms of what the end game is. If the end game is to say wage lawfare that is using the law the government's laws as a weapon of war against the citizenry and and violating their rights and liberties and so forth, then that would be more evocative of being extra constitutional versus legal interstices is when uh, us peon citizens are using uh, and exploiting legal loopholes in order to protect our freedom. So I think either way you're looking at it, whether it's the government uh, exploiting loopholes or things along those lines, or us explo- exploiting loopholes. I think these are just two different terms to describe the, the exploitation of loopholes uh, for very different ends. So for one, it's the government uh, exploiting the loopholes in order to infringe on our freedom, and then the interstices are when we exploit the loopholes in order to protect our freedom. Uh, w- to simplify this a little bit more, one could think of the interstices as a form of self-defense, uh, in a manner of speaking. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's definitely uh, definitely a good way to put it. Uh, and I think that the next the next thing to kind of distinguish here is that uh, you know using le- legal interstices, and we'll we'll get more into you know examples and things uh, here in just a moment. So if you're still a little confused, then then and that's okay. Uh, and also the, the term I'm going to use right now will be in, will be discussed at length in the next uh, episode of the Vani Podcast. So just just kind of you know all you kind of need is I, I don't know just 
a tenuous grasp of, of, of kind of what we're discussing here just to, to kind of describe what legal interstices are and what they are not. So legal interstices are not political crusading at all. They, they just aren't. Using uh, legal interstices uh, or exploiting the loopholes uh, as they are today, and you know, there's no, there's no, there's no effort to change or repeal them. It's just, uh, you know, I, I, I realize that you know there's a loophole here, and I can benefit from it, and I'm going to use it. I'm not going out and, uh, you know, trying to uh, make those laws less strict. I'm not trying to, if I'm an outright status, you know, try to make those laws more, those penalties more harsher, or you know, close that loophole. There's, there's no uh, reformism or political crusading here at all. I, I think that's probably accurate. So, you know, as we'll get into in that other episode uh, in, a, in a little bit later, uh, yeah, the political crusading is all about changing the laws, right? Whether you want more tyranny or, or you prefer liberty, uh, the crusading is all about changing the laws. Interstices are the, basically the polar opposite of that, where it's the laws as they are today. So today, if you were to use, say, a legal remedy or file a motion in court or file a lawsuit or pick any one of, you know, 10,000 different types of interstices, the point is it's usable today, or at least it has the potential to be useful. Again, to, to keep in mind, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, I don't play one on TV, but in the attempt to not be ignorant of the law, as that infamous legal maximum goes, uh, ignorant a juris non excusat, Part of that uh, entails basically understanding interstices, that there are certain things that, uh, and loopholes that can be exploited uh, for various different ends, whether for good ends or bad ends. And I think that's pretty much what we're getting at here. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, and this is something you brought up uh, when we were preparing for this, and I think it was uh, definitely an important point. Uh, now, now the, the point here is that the legal interest. The legal interstices available to someone greatly depend upon, you know, their their citizenship status. You know, they have to, you know, have standing. Uh, I guess maybe that's not the best way to put it, but they actually have to be like a, uh, uh, a citizen, you know, uh, to to actually actually exploit these laws. So, uh, I guess, do, do you want to speak to that? Well, sure. Uh, you know, if if people look at certain things like, well, what I've written about previously, especially concerning the National Security Agency, the NSA, when there were attempts by people to counteract the dragnet wiretapping done by that particular administrative agency, uh, fourth branch of government and all that, where uh, they would try and sue in court. And it turns out that they couldn't, that they failed in doing that because they didn't have standing to sue because they couldn't prove the plaintiffs, the citizens couldn't prove that they individually were being harmed by uh, the NSA. So there was a little bit of an assumption they were making that the judge basically struck down, uh, struck down and said, oh yeah, you're wrong about that, which was quite simply that, <laughs> uh, that no, there was no interstice there at all. Uh, they were, as far as the judge put it, uh, they were flat wrong. And that wasn't just one case, that was two different cases. Uh, one of them being uh, NSA versus Jewel, I believe it was, and then there was uh, another one I don't quite recall right offhand. The point, though, is that there's legal precedent that you can't sue the government for dragnet wiretapping, at least not the NSA anyway, because you can't prove that you yourself uh, were, were harmed. Now, an example of something that would be a legal interstice that is usable today would, of course, be things like tax havens. And so learning and relying on the laws is, is an interesting approach, isn't it? Some people even go so far as to study and, yes, even rely on the laws of, of foreign countries in order to avoid uh, property thefts, in, in a manner of speaking. Uh, some people would call this jurisdictional arbitrage. And so obviously I think you can kind of see where uh, the government would not exactly be happy that the citizenry are exploiting these loopholes in order to protect their property rights. And so therefore, they, the state itself would in some ways engage in its own version of political crusading by trying to outlaw things like cash. I believe there's some articles at the Mises Institute, uh, LVMI, where they've got, uh, they call it the war on cash now, I think is what they call it, Shane. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and obviously, it's been kind of known for a while that uh, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, has been on and off over the years trying to shut down uh, offshore tax havens. So that it's kind of interesting, right? So, uh, you know, interstices are not exactly uh, always universally 100% certain. It really does matter what types of interstices we're talking about, and that, therefore the specificity 
is, is definitely uh, significant. But as far as like the general concept goes, which is what we're mainly focusing here tonight, is that, yeah, you can totally, uh, Americans can totally exploit interstices, legal loopholes in the law in order to protect their own freedom. And uh, every once in a while, it can actually work. Indeed. Indeed, it can. Indeed, it can. So, uh, you know what, what we've kind of done with these initial episodes? You know, we, we take a look at what Rayo actually had to say about some of these things. So, I guess in short, uh, I'll just kind of mention this and then I'll read a, a couple of excerpts uh, a, a couple of excerpts from his book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. But, uh, yeah, in short, legal interstices are not Vanu. They are two different things. Remember in the introductory podcast, Rayo defined liberty as a general exemption from coercion. So, Legal interstices are how liberty's general exemptions from coercion are achieved. Uh, so do you want to speak to that before I read these quotes, Kyle, or do you think that's just you think that's well enough said? I, I would just simply add that, remember, just to, and obviously in these beginning podcasts, you know, there'll, there'll be a little bit of repetition, but it's more just to familiarize everybody with, with kind of what this entire series is about. Remember, Vanu is about achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Now, the legal interstices are not themselves an invulnerability. They are a, a liberty, right? A general exemption from coercion. So what we're focusing on tonight are what are those general exemptions? You know, how does all, how does all of that work? And also, what did Rayo have to say about those general exemptions from coercion? And how did he distinguish between that and, and Vanu, which is about invulnerability? And that's, that's what we're focusing on here tonight. Well, let's find out. So on page 28 of his book, he says, quote, To some, deception, concealment, seems so difficult or unpleasant that they opt instead for liberance, playing legal interstices while remaining otherwise conventional and visible. For myself, I'm not especially interested in liberance, partly because millions of people are already playing those games for all they are worth. I don't believe I could come up with gimmicks much better than what thousands of tax lawyers, accountants, draft advisors, etc. are doing. And legal interstices are transitory. As quickly as many people discover a dodge, the bludge, uh, that's obviously, uh, that's what uh, Rayo calls, you know, government agents, bludgies. Uh, bludge, the, the bludge move in to close it. Of course, a particular Vani way may not offer permanent security either. There will be new detection and counter-detection techniques. But once Vanuans get below the noise level of environmental change caused by animals, weather, and or non-Vanuans, the bludge and their detectives will be at the point of diminishing returns. In the short term, and this is the important part, guys. In the short term, certain forms of liberance have their attractions and are worth using. But I believe Vanu has a greater long-range potential, end quote. So uh, I think that's pretty, uh, <laughs> pr pretty cut and dry, you know, Kyle? Yeah, I, I think what Rayo was trying to get at here was that the interstices at best are something that one would rely on, or shall I say fall back on, more as like a rear guard action. Uh, you know, uh, for example, if, if you get picked up by the bludgies, the blue coats, the government police, the, uh, <laughs> the pigs... If you get picked up by them and, you know, they slap the cuffs on, throw you in the paddy wagon, and now you're in a government dungeon for five, six, seven, eight, nine months or longer, depending on, on what uh, they're trying to persecute you over, then at that juncture in a situation like that where you are a political prisoner, it's a little late to be invulnerable to coercion, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the only thing that can really help you at that point are the interstices and things like due process, things like... Not, um, not incriminating yourself. Uh, well, yeah, the protection against self-incrimination, right? I mean, pretty much if you look at any Constitution's Bill of Rights, those Bills of Rights uh, for any of the 51 American governments are, are really just a list of legal interstices, right? So the, the, uh, the alleged protections about everything ranging from RBKA, right to keep and bear arms, self-defense, if you will, RBKA, free speech, uh, religious liberty, uh, search and seizure, warrants, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that stuff are basically uh, a, a type of legal interstice, I think. So yeah, and, and and I think that's a good point to make because they aren't to be relied upon. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, people rely on you know like the Fourth Amendment, like the cops can search my car without uh, without a search warrant, or you know I, I guess uh, uh, without a search warrant, but 
uh, uh, lo and behold, some people have uh, found out firsthand that they don't need a damn search warrant. So relying upon that specific legal interstice uh, has uh, not benefited, or it's actually hurt uh, quite a few people who, you know, kind of relied upon. I have a Fourth Amendment right. Okay, uh, you keep thinking that, bud. Uh, let's just tear apart your car and, you know, break shit and not have to pay for it. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's. I think you're, you make a very good point there. Well, let me just follow up on something. You said something interesting. The, you know, the, you know, when Rayo mentioned about laws and their uh, interpretations often change. I think you said that elsewhere in the book. You know, I, you know, in in much of my research, I've kind of discovered something similar. So, like when my last book came out about security culture, two of the chapters in there, or they're actually also standalone articles in my blog. One was about the issue regarding uh, cellular telephones. And the other was about like your your own like personal records more general generally whether paper records, uh, f- computer files on a, on your hard drive like on your computer and and so forth. And one thing I kept seeing over and over again, and this is particularly true with the cell phones, is that you don't enjoy any Fourth Amendment or Fourth Amendment equivalent protections, like ever. And if it's a cell phone, that goes double and triple where they can just warrantlessly search whatever. And so those legal interstices regarding those specific things are basically now worthless, even though in the past there used to be at least a thin veneer of legality. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, let me read this, uh, this last quote here real quick, uh, and then we can, we can discuss further. This is from page 81, quote, We have some experience with bicycles and don't think they're an answer. A bike means more time in bludge lane per trip, more red lighters and other dangerous drivers whizzing by. As for bikes not needing licenses, that is just a liberty, legal interstice, not a vanu, relative physical invulnerability, and probably a short-lived one. Lived one. Already tax-hungry bludge in California are proposing state licensing of bikes just like automobiles. The fees will supposedly go for maintenance of bikeways. Big deal, end quote. Now, I actually thought about this right before. I don't, I don't know why, why I didn't think of this yet, but uh, yeah, right, right, when I was, right before we, we started recording this, I actually kind of have an example of of, of kind of why Rayo is, is is kind of right here. So, back back in high school, uh, there was uh, uh, and obviously there's a little racial profiling here, but there was only one black kid in the school. Like it was a smaller school, and uh, uh, he actually got pulled over and fined on his bicycle for not having for not having reflectors on it. Uh, because he was on a public road. So I think that's uh, something to also kind of consider, too. If you're on public roads, you still have to follow the bludgy's laws. So, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think Ray is right here uh, uh, insofar. I mean, is it a, p- a potential, is it a potential, you know, alternative? Sure. But uh, is it uh, any better? I mean, there, there, there's still that risk there. Yeah, and I don't disagree with Rayo about much, but on this one, I will just simply offer a counterpoint um, you know, Rayo mentions about bikes not needing licenses. That's just a liberty or legal interstice. Well, hell, I could say the same thing when you're uh, traveling in your privately owned automobile on the public roads, which was pretty much a, a large chunk of what my extra constitutional series was about. So, you know, the question of how can you achieve Vanu while traveling on, on the roads, public or private, is is rather rather kind of a at least currently unsolvable question at least at least at present unless somebody comes up with a good idea lord knows i've tried right that that last article in my extra constitutional series i actually tried to see if there was any sort of real vanu way of of dealing with that and the closest thing i came up with was well maybe some maybe if you get a sailboat instead go on the bright blue waters and you know just avoid the roads altogether i mean that's the closest thing i guess unless you i mean I mean, think about this. I mean, how many people get harassed by uh, the Coast Guard as opposed to uh, the bludgies on, on the land? You know, I, I don't think it's even close. <laughs> right. So, I mean, if we're going to talk about Vanu specifically, that, that invulnerability to coercion, I mean, at this point, it would, it would seem a little bit more, you know, I, I know you like the sailboats and all that, which, which is going to be its own episode. But that seems to me to be kind of where it's going, that anything on land is just so tightly controlled that the only time where you can even have a little bit of breathing space, and I personally would be in favor of something like using a bicycle for some types of trips under some circumstances, particularly if the weather is kinder, right? I wouldn't recommend anybody going on a bicycle in a blizzard, okay? Um, but I, I would just simply say that we're kind of all stuck with legal interstices, at least for the time being, because too many of our fellow human beings are authoritarians uh, who essentially think that uh, public roads are like an immutable law of the universe, as if it's as if public roads are gravity. 
And, um, you know, the fact that even the minarchists, people who believe in limited government, really uh, don't go as far as I do in saying that, hey, maybe we need to privatize the roads and, and, and go that route, even though that itself is a legal interstice, right? Like I proved in that series. Yep. yep. Um, you know, it's, it's just kind of, again, I don't want to get too far off into, into that particular topic. Just suffice it to say, I see where Rayo's going with this, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. And maybe if he had used a little bit of a better um, example, then that would have been a little clearer for everybody. But again, the point is, is that, yes, there's a difference between a legal interstice and, and Vanu. That's the key thing. These are two different things that at times do uh, cross over, right? And I think Rayo was kind of pointing that out, that it's kind of this, uh, the interstices are kind of this undesirable thing that Vanuans actually do have to deal with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And we're kind of sorry, guys, we're kind of revisiting what Vanu isn't once again. But but again, this is this is this is important stuff this is important stuff. But I, I think an important question to ask here is why? Why did Rayo mention legal interstices at all? I mean, obviously, he wasn't a fan of them. Uh, he wasn't a fan of them. He kind of just saw them as like a temporary kind of uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, the state's here and until uh, better Vanu strategies are uh, discovered. Uh, it's kind. Of, it's, it's kind of something that you have to do to remain as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible. Because uh, I'll tell you what: uh, if, if you're if you're driving without a uh, driver's license, without registration, you're probably you're 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 definitely more vulnerable to coercion. You definitely are, and you're more yeah, you're more likely to be pulled over. Yeah, I I, I think so. So I don't know, man. It's just. I think what's happened, and I'll use this more as a passing example, unless you really want to get into it. But really, what happened to Alex Ansari um, in you know up until he got that that land where he was living in his RV full time? Um, I mean, that really kind of made me kind of sit back and really ponder some stuff pretty deeply. Like, was was you know was Alex like invulnerable to coercion? Whenever, you know, the cops would go, you know, knock, knock, knock on his RV at like three in the morning, which happened to him at least a couple times over the course of that year and a half or so. Yeah. Now, yeah. It, is, now it is true that, you know, Alex Ansari did do that kind of thing uh, this decade in the 2010s, right? As opposed to when Rayo was doing van dwelling, which will be its own episode, uh, he was in the 1960s and early 70s, right? So maybe... The, the some cultural attitudes in those decades are different from now. Maybe that has some relevance. I'm I'm not exactly certain, but you know, if we're going to take Alex Ansari as a more contemporary example, uh, I'm not exactly uh, thrilled with the fact that there might not actually be any Vanu for uh, traveling on on the roads such as they are today, unless we're going to go in the direction of road privatization. But then other factors have to come into it in order to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's uh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, and uh, that kind of leads right into. Uh, I forgot we had this quote in there. The, the final quote from uh, from Rayo's book is from page twenty six. Quote: With our present capability, line C. Uh, he's uh, sorry. Side note here: He's referring to uh, a mean time to a harassment chart in his book. Uh, now, if you go to that PDF, you can you can actually look at that chart. But that's we're not going to get into that here because that's a, that's a whole other episode. But uh, uh, quote with our present capability, line C, we really aren't able to enjoy a comfortable home for the year round and be Vanu. The price of living in a van is some submission to the blutch, maintaining a driver's license, paying attention to the legalities of parking in a particular area, etc. With the van, we are in large part enjoying liberty, legal interstices, not Vanu. And laws and their interpretations often change. In quote, so I mean, I we've we've kind of already addressed that. Uh, I mean, pretty much every single facet of that. Uh, anything else you want to mention there? It, I would just say that what Rayo said back, you know, in the '60s and '70s when he wrote that, I would say still holds true today. And my series on you know ex, on what uh, ex, the extra constitutional series does seem to further confirm that. Although to be fair, I was writing about Texas. Rayo was, of course, up in the Siskiyou region, which I believe is Oregon or thereabouts. North, North, Northern, Northern California and Oregon. And I want to mention this, too. But uh, I think it would have even been more relaxed in, in, in Rayo's days because uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, stories from my parents' age, you know, when they were, like, in uh, high school, like, in the 80s, and they were, you know, drinking and driving. They could get out and talk to the cops, and the cops would sometimes just say, give me the beer, just drive home. Uh, so, like, like, today they're very, very, very stringent. So... Um, and I mean, yeah, that might have been small town cops, but uh, small town bludgies. But uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know. Maybe that's something to to consider too. Uh, maybe that I guess the the change in in culture, change in the uh, the the uh, bludgy culture 
so to speak? Because it's I I would say it's it's definitely ramped up. Would you agree? Well, yeah, the, the police are militarized now far more so than they were in, in previous decades. I mean, even even the advocates of limited government now have started screaming about that, which which I guess is a good development. But yeah, the fact of the matter is that, you know, no matter how much oath keeping uh, they try to promote, the fact is that the police might as well be the military. And if you look at foreign countries, especially European ones like Italy, where they have a military police uh, harassing the citizenry, and they are literally called military police and have a military type power, but they can also like search and harass citizens, Italians and such. I would suggest that the allegedly civilian police forces here, municipal, county, state, etc., are in fact might as well be military police just because of the flak jackets, the SWAT teams, and a lot of the other crud that uh, they're doing where they're just thuggish, just more generally, even if it's just one patrol cop in a, in a, in a squad car. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, let's, 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 I mean, we, we've kind of talked negatively about legal interstices, but I, I do think, as Rayo kind of did, they, they do play their role, uh, especially if there are no, uh, there are no Vanu solutions available. Now, I think the most important one, and this is good for you know the uh, uh, the risk adverse folks, you know the the fo the ones that you know don't want to end up in prison. Uh, you're you're kind of actually obeying the law whenever you're practicing legal interstices. Uh, now, whether that's uh, uh, as, as Rayo said, you know, maintaining a driver's license uh, is a legal interstice. Uh, so obviously, uh, if you have that, you're not gonna get you're not gonna get thrown in jail, I guess. But but there are some. Some other ones too, as we mentioned uh, at the very beginning, you know, tax havens. Uh, now that's illegal interstice. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> the state obviously doesn't like that. Uh, the IRS doesn't like that. Yeah, there, there's no civil disobedience uh, and, and little to no risk of being arrested. Well, yeah, and and so I know there's lots of um, I know there's lots of advocates within the alternative media who often proselytize about civil disobedience. But remember, civil disobedience is illegal activity by definition. And it makes you more vulnerable to coercion. Well, I know some of them would kind of argue the opposite, and I would more be along, along the lines to agree with you because, unfortunately, a lot of those civilly disobedient activist protester types are usually, ironically, usually tend to rely on jury on a jury nullification defenses for when, they are, when their cases go to court, ironically enough, but most of the time they can't even get a jury trial. Uh, again, that's that's getting into a more due process issue, but yeah, the point is is that uh, if you're doing civil disobedience, and more particularly the brazen style of civil disobedience, like falling on your sword, or shall we say squatting at a certain refuge in Oregon, if you know what I mean, uh, then yeah, it's just kind of like, I, I think you're just making yourselves more vulnerable when you didn't necessarily have to. Legal interstices, by contrast, is where you are obeying the law, but you are using it as a tool against the state. It's, it's a very much in the spirit of guerrilla warfare, except instead of uh, you know, taking pot shots at enemy soldiers, instead you're um, using paperwork and legal language to arguably do something kind of similar, uh, legally anyway. It reminds me, a, a few nights ago I watched a, a video of Gavin Siam uh, you know, uh, there was a traffic stop and he was going to go fill in the cops and he was just sitting there making sure, you know, this person was less invulnerable to coercion since there was a camera on, on him and the cops. And, uh, uh, lo and behold, lo and behold, you know, filming cops is, is supposedly legal. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, cops came over to him and said that he was uh, impeding upon an investigation. Uh, he had his three kids in the back seat or four kids, however many, how many, how many little people he's popped out. But, uh, uh, but yeah, him, his wife is his three or four kids. They were all in there and, uh, they threatened to, uh, take uh, Gavin and his wife to uh, prison or to, to jail and his uh, kids to, uh, you know, DCFS. So, uh, or whatever the child protection uh, equivalent there is. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the noble goal of, trying to uh, ensure that someone's less vulnerable to coercion uh, while putting yourself in a, in a similar position. Even, I mean, so even, even, some, even some of these things are completely legal, but uh, when you're dealing with bludgies, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the law doesn't apply to them. It only applies to you. Well, yeah, and remember there's also kind of, uh, and many constitutionalists will recognize this, but the, the notion of color of law, right, where the police or just the bludgies, just more generally per, uh, prosecutors, or should I say persecutors and such, uh, those types of attorneys and all that, they will do things like act as if they are acting under a semblance of legal process, but they are in fact actually breaking the law, provably. 
So in a sense, it's almost like the opposite version of being uh, of when they are acting extra constitutionally. It's almost the opposite version of that is what color of law is. And so when you're describing about how they're um, essentially harassing somebody for filming them, it's like, well, you know, depending on what the interstices are in that particular jurisdiction, those police may very well be acting under color of law. But then again, again, depending where you are, the same exact action may in fact be more extra constitutional. But see, this is the problem with most activists, Shane, is that they actually do not read law like the founders did. They don't do it. And so when they claim that they are for liberty, that they claim to manifest freedom or, or whatever, I mean, my particular favorite one is when they say, uh, liberty is uh, my highest political value. And therefore, I'm a libertarian is kind of how they, they've sold it. And it's like, well, that's interesting because, you know, Ronald Reagan pr professed to uh, have liberty as his highest value. But I don't think anybody's calling him a libertarian anytime soon. And, Hell no. And, and you have also some other people claiming that their, uh, you know, liberty is their highest political value and so forth. When, in fact, every action they take actually grows big government and so forth. You can kind of see the problem. Uh, and so when you're looking at liberty as defined by Rayo being a general exemption from coercion, you know, should liberty necessarily be your highest value if indeed that liberty can only be exercised practically through legal interstices, one type of which would be something like a Bill of Rights? <laughs> Taking this to its logical conclusion, as for at least for Rayo, having a, a driver's license is living, uh, living in liberty. Uh, that's, that's, that's bad. That's bad. If that's your highest political value, uh, at least to uh, to Rayo, I think he would have said that you he would have said that you have controlled schizophrenia, which will be another future episode. But uh, but we, we this is supposed to be a, a, a section about benefits. Section about benefits. So let, I guess let, let's kind of discuss those here real briefly because I, I, I think we more kind of side with Rayo here on uh, our, our biases are, are becoming interjected into the narrative, which is which is inevitable. But uh, but anyways, I mean uh, there are some side benefits. There, there really are. Now now one something I promote and Kyle Kyle introduced me to this concept of canceling the voter registration. You follow the laws on the books as they are. Uh, you're essentially revoking consent to be governed as much as the state will legally allow. It's a really, really big positive when it comes to uh, legal interstices, uh, especially the canceling the voter registration. Uh, you're no longer on the jury wheel for the federal government, so uh, you can't be called into a federal, you know, a, a, a federal uh, district court uh, to serve on a jury. Which, you know, uh, uh, if, I've read about how how uh, hellish the uh, local courthouses are, the county courthouses are. I can't even imagine walking into uh, you know a, a federal courthouse like that. So uh, that's definitely a benefit. That's definitely a benefit. Any, anything on that, Kyle? No, I just say that I can't imagine walking to a federal courthouse either. I mean, that must be walking into, like, the gates of Mordor or something. Like, you know, the, 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 the overarch of, of Hades or something. I think, I think the listeners kind of know where I'm getting at. It's not, a, you know, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. You know, it's not exactly a happy place to go. And, and that goes double and triple if you're a defendant, right? If you're the one actually being persecuted. But yeah, I mean, that was something I kind of discovered really more by accident when I canceled my voter, voter registration. I think it was, geez, it's 2017, right? So four years ago now, actually. Um, yeah, and, and so, and that's mainly because they only, the federal government, uh, at least when I contacted them and then I followed up on it in some of their other literature and such, yeah, they only look at the voter re re registration databases. They don't look at the driver license databases. But then for some strange reason, the Texas judiciary uh, does look at both the voter registration and the uh, driver's license databases, and still, I, and still, I, I still have that. As we were joking, Shane, a moment ago about uh, uh, I enjoy my liberty of of the driver's license and all that, which I still unfortunately have. Uh, I can still be called up for jury duty based on that reason alone. That yeah, and that's that's how it is here in Illinois, and uh, that the handful of state. Well, I guess I, I look through all fifty states, and, and they're. Uh, I think that I'll just kind of just briefly. Yeah, I think in most states they pull from multiple uh, multiple areas because a lot of uh, some lower income folks, especially those that are on public transportation and such, might not have driver's licenses. So uh, uh, so yeah, they want to make sure they have a, a wide uh, a wide net to uh, to grab from. Uh, I'm gonna skip this next one because that leads in that leads into a uh, into a really bad negative. Uh, but uh, uh, but the next one, the gun show loophole. Uh, yeah, the gun show loophole. I mean, that's a pretty stable loophole, to be completely honest. I mean, how long have the leftists been trying to, uh, or as I like to call them, the anti anti gun pussies, uh, been trying to uh, have it? Like they've been clamoring about that. Like, hey, they're the gun show loophole. Anyone can get an assault rifle. Still there. <laughs> well, yeah, and look at things like uh, defense distributed uh, ghost gunner. 
where you can 3D print firearms with, uh, you know, unserialized, or excuse me, that's actually the CNC mill. I'm sorry. Yeah, the CNC mill uh, using E percent uh, unserialized uh, AR rifles, right? Mm -hmm. and, then you, and then you basically get the, the ghost gun and you, and you fin finish them up. And then, of course, before that, there was actually the actual 3D printed gun, which was uh, the single shot Liberator. So, yeah. and, and so, you know, that's another type of interstice involving firearms. But yeah, even if you were to buy the more traditional, typical firearms with serial numbers on them and all that, then yeah, there is such a thing as private sales. And, you know, the gun show loophole is, you know, a stable loophole as opposed to an unstable loophole. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into that here in a moment. We'll get it. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get, uh, we'll get in that here in a moment. I skipped that for a purpose. We'll, we'll, we'll close out this section with that because it'll be, it'll be a, a potential benefit that leads into, into a very, very bad negative. So sorry to cut you off there. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we have these out of order, but, uh, uh, the next one, and this is one I'm kind of, uh, you know, very interested in, but uh, you know, learning the learning the legal interstices is a uh, necessary prerequisite to conducting jurisdictional arbitrage. You know, i.e., country shopping. Uh, now, when Pete Cisco does his uh, his uh, you know perpetual traveling, he's got to know the laws that he's the laws of the place he's going to. He's got to know how long he can stay. He's got to know uh, uh, what sort of you know visa or tourist slave paper, whatever whatever it is. I don't know what what all these countries call it. But he's got to be very knowledgeable on uh, you know uh, where he can go with uh, with his current uh, status. Uh, for expatriation, I mean, uh, not a big fan of the guy, but Jeff Berwick, uh, he had to know the laws of Acapulco before he, you know, expatriated from, from Canada to there, right? And, I mean, arguably, I, I don't know how much more freer Jeff Berwick is. He says he is. I don't know how, uh, yeah, I don't know how free, uh, you know, Mex Mexico is considering drug cartels and such, but, uh, I'll just, I'll just claim ignorance there. But, uh, but yeah, perpetual traveling for Pete Cisco, it's, it seems to be, uh, extremely, extremely freeing, so... Uh, so that's, I guess that's one example of legal interstices being a, a potential way to increase your own personal freedom. Yeah. I mean, obviously that's going to have to be its own episode, but yeah, just saying in transitory passing here is that, you know, when it comes to perpetual traveling, the interstices become rather much more important than not in a lot of ways. And unless the portion of it that is Vanu or would, or could be Vanu, would be uh, the actual moving around the mobility that rail really heavily emphasized. Unless that itself is where the real invulnerability and coercion comes in, uh, I'm not quite seeing how moving around internationally between ports of entry, uh, you know, that are basically the bottlenecks for these nation states necessarily keeps somebody, you know, relatively free from coercion. Again, a little bit of a debatable point. We'll save it for that episode. But yeah, just just keep in mind that. If people who are using perpetual traveling, whether it's the three flag approach or five flag approach, they are having to rely on legal interstices. I mean, anybody ever mm -hmm. heard of a passport? That's a legal interstice, by the way. Yes, it is, and it's a uh, necessary prerequisite if you are going to, uh, you know, go country shopping and such. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely get more into that uh, that later on. Uh, now, this is one that you brought up to me, Kyle, and I I'm I'm, a, I'm aware of it, obviously, but I'm not even going to try to articulate this. So, last wills and testaments. If I remember correctly, this should be in the Texas Estate Code, so it's a state law where where I'm at. But basically, the long and short of it is that. In Texas, um, you can you can essentially more or less, uh, or at least mostly avoid probate court if you hand write your last will and testament, um, you know, basically on a piece of paper using an actual you know pen and paper and all that, or pencil and paper, or actually no pen would probably be better, right? More permanent, right? If you're if you're six feet under, the court will actually need an original handwritten letter uh, or or document, as it were, that follows. A certain legal prescription, and actually, there's it's and it's right there in the statutory code, the exact format they want you to use. And then, of course, they say like fill in your name here and you know whatever else. And you know that's kind of interesting in terms of property transferals uh, that are you know after death, because yeah. remember, probate court is largely focused on negotiating like who like whom should get what, how should the property, the estate. The totality of, of that of that deceased citizen's estate is, is divvied up and all that. But you know, if if the, you can have an actual original record, not something photocopied, not something Photoshop or fraudulent, but actually in what they call the testator, that's the dead guy, the testator's own hand, 
then then that could be acceptable. And just as a historical side note, um, the justification for this goes back to many cases, a series of case uh, of case law here in Texas. One in particular was interesting. A farmer was uh, had an accident and basically he was pinned either under or around his tractor and he scrawled on the on the fender something I think it was something to the effect of everything to wife and he died so later when they went to probate court at that time considering how the laws were uh, all, all that uh, one of the lawyers had to do was uh, they, they apparently brought in the bumper as you know that fender as an exhibit, as physical evidence to the judge to show that, hey, this is, you know, this, you know, we shouldn't really even have to be here and, you know, hold a trial or whatever, uh, he any court hearings. This is pretty clear. This, this should be satisfactory. And the judge decided to rule that, yes, indeed, everything to wife on offender uh, was satisfactory enough to actually, uh, you know, le legitimize the property transferal to the widow. And that was rather yeah. interesting. And so over time, that com that truly common law and then established basically that kind of legal interstice right here in Texas to the point where the current version is as long as you follow in the statutory code, the Texas, I think it was the Texas Estates Code, uh, exactly how, and maybe I should write an article about this at some point explaining it in more in detail, but just suffice it for now, just, you know, follow the form, then yeah, you should be able to avoid probate court or at least a lot of it. And that's something yeah. not a lot of people know about. Yeah, yeah, and it reminds me. And I'm almost done with it. Uh, I, I'm almost done with it again. So I'm not going to bring this up again. I'm sure, but uh, but yeah, like Parks and Rec, it was funny as hell when uh, uh, when Ron uh, didn't have a uh, uh, or his, his his essential his his note was uh, whoever to, who whatever man or animal defeats me gets all my shit. Is essentially what it said, <laughs> and. Uh, I I can't remember who it was that uh, that brought this up to him, but uh, <laughs> and and for those who don't watch the show, Ron's uh, I mean he he's he's uh, I guess you could call it like a political crusader, but it's 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 the only it's one of the only times where uh, you know a, a libertarian or even an anarchist kind of gets a fair shot uh, in, in a TV show. But uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, someone brought up uh, Ron. Well, you know if you don't have a will, the everything that you own will go to the government. And the, just the most horrified look on his face. I mean, he talks about how much gold he has buried around and how much money he's got saved up and all of this. And uh, and it just so he went he went and got, he went and got himself a will. Uh, <laughs> right. So 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 yeah, I think that's 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 definitely an interesting one. And it's 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 not really one that there really aren't any negatives to it uh, to to utilizing that. I mean, the negatives come when you don't do that. And 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 maybe there in Indiana, maybe probably not because of the TV show. But maybe in some states, if you don't have a will, maybe it does go directly to the state. I don't know. Or maybe there's probate in every state. I I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not well researched on that. But uh, but anyways, anyways, now that uh, we we've gone down down that little digression, uh, Castilla County. So uh. I guess just real briefly, Kyle. I know that uh, we, you've talked about this a lot on on radio shows, and uh, and also you've written long articles on it and such. But uh, I guess a, a brief overview of what happened in in Castilla County. I guess what uh, what was what the uh, the off graders were doing, and uh, then that can segue right into the uh, ramifications. So I guess start with the benefits, uh, and then also kind of just uh, lead that right into the, uh, the ramifications. Well, okay, so we were mentioning the gun show loophole a little bit ago. So, like, that would be a stable loophole, right? You can do your private uh, sales, uh, which are property transferals. You know, they, you know the, the seller hands you the rifle, the ammunition, or whatever the hell else, accoutrements. You hand over the cash or gold or silver. Hell, maybe they will even take Bitcoin one of these years. Who knows? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure one of them, I'm sure there are places where you can buy guns with Bitcoin. That's something I'll need to look into, huh? Oh, that'd be interesting, right? If, especially if both the buyer and the seller have like smartphones or something, you can do it like, you know, in the middle of a, you know, a, a gun show, right? Uh, where usually they don't have a lot of computers, at least, at least of the ones I've been to. Uh, but then, uh, but then I would also say there is such a thing as an unstable loophole. And when I wrote the article basically explaining what had happened in Costia County in uh, late 2015 regarding what I can only reasonably describe as nuisance abatement ordinances being enforced by the county government, the bludgies. What kind of set the stage for that was when there were a bunch of off-gridders and, and people living in RVs or van dwellers, as, as Ray himself practiced, again, another episode for another time, uh, they were essentially trying to, uh, there was this, <laughs> this loophole about camping permits on your own land uh, because the county ordinances basically, the land use code essentially was saying that 
uh, in order to uh, live full time on your own property that you pay property taxes on and see there's already kind of a problem there, right? But anyway, uh, to, in order to live on the unimproved lot that you're paying the property taxes on, uh, you have to have like a septic installed and like some other stuff or, or, or at the very least some sort of structure. And then it depends, well, what's defined as a structure and basically you need something, a foundation, all that it can't be something movable essentially. And so the interstice, the loophole that the off-gridders had tr were exploiting was essentially, <laughs> and people are going to fucking love this, was essentially renewing camping permits over and over and over and over and over again because the camping permits were only for a set time period. Uh, something along the lines of, what was it, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, something along those lines. And so they were just renewing the camping permits over and over again. So the bureaucrats uh, for the county government got wise to this and they were realizing, wait a minute, these people who own you know, these unimproved lots in our, in our county, as one of them actually said when he was interviewed by the press, in our county uh, are not actually building any structures. They're just living in their RVs and just simply renewing the camping permits. Well, we got to close the loophole. And that's exactly what the hell they did. And there were people who quite literally got, uh, or at least in one sense or another, got run off their own land. They had to move. They eventually ended up selling. Um, you know, one couple in particular did for certain. Uh, you know, even, even there was even one man who is a, a veteran, military veteran, who wasn't even in the valley portion of the San Luis Valley, at the SLV, but he was actually up on a nearby mountaintop. And he got harassed because he, too, was trying to kind of encourage a sense of solidarity amongst the off-gridders there, and, and he was targeted by the government because they viewed him as being vulnerable. So that, that's kind of the long and short as far as Costilla County goes. Very interesting case study. Uh, would be worthy of its own podcast perhaps sometime, but regarding legal interstices, Costilla County is an example of what happens when you try to exploit an unstable loophole and then the bludgies move in to close it, as Rayo himself, I think, was one of the quotes you just read a little bit ago. Yep. I mean, Costia County is exactly what happens when they move in to close it. And then the fallout was, was just that horribleness of, of people. I think, uh, I think there was also a different couple that went homeless, quite literally living under a bridge at one point, if I remember correctly. There was some really nasty stuff that happened. And they were just, you know, we'll just keep renewing the camping permits and we'll be fine. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Yep. Yep. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, they they found a way to exploit uh, that that uh, legal interstice, and uh, then the government closed in on it, and there were some very very terrible ramifications. So uh, again, to reiterate, I mean, uh, yeah, these these legal interstices uh, can be beneficial to use, uh, and especially like uh, you know, uh, legal interstice of having a driver's license and registration and things, uh, you know, might actually you know help you stay uh, uh, help you avoid some of this uh, coercion. But again. Uh, some of these things can uh, can can detriment detrimentally you know damage you. So, uh, so I guess that there's also another aspect to look in here too, Kyle. And uh, I, I I've kind of uh, gotten into this uh, this a little bit, but you're you're definitely the uh, uh, I guess the uh, the uh, unofficial expert on, on on this portion. But extra or, uh, exploiting these loopholes obviously uh, takes some some legal research. You gotta you know you gotta read a lot of law. You gotta figure out which ones you can exploit. You gotta figure out which ones are stable and unstable. Uh, there's a lot of uh, legal research that goes into this. So I think that's definitely uh, definitely a negative there too, don't you think? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, a, a lot of my work that's that's on my blog, and especially most recently the the extra constitutional series. I mean, most of that is all basically all legal research. I'm not, for once, I'm not actually talking about like trying to solve problems or, or war games, certain things, and basically focus on what some people would call activism. I was really just more trying to figure out how the system was put together, especially regarding a particular thing, regarding, you know, the right to travel infringements and so forth. And in order to do that, I had to locate bodies of law and then learn how to make sense of the legalese or legal English, which is different from plain English, which is what we're speaking now, uh, that, that the lawyers use to try and, um, I guess you could say, engage in uh, befuddlement of sorts, cause confusion in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, I mean, if people want to try and learn what legal interstices are available to them, I would say the first thing they need to do is, how, is learn how to do legal research. And there, And thankfully, there are some somewhat user-friendly books on how to exactly go about doing that. Me personally, as a former homeschooler, I just kind of learned to do it kind of in some ways ad hoc, 
Uh, but, but, but even other people, some of my readers from my blog, you know, would get in contact with me and say that, that I was doing a better job than even some of the people who had written books on legal research. And, you know, I'm kind of hearing that from some of my readers. And so, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I just kind of find it rather interesting that just as a common man, a non-lawyer, you know, I'm trying not to be ignorant of the law. And in the attempt to do that, I have to basically gain this entire skill set. In, in order to do so. And yes, part of that also involves the, uh, the law dictionaries. Uh, you know, periodically I'll throw up a post on the blog and try to legally define a legal term uh, of whatever kind. So it'll be like something legally defined. So uh, like contracts legally defined or, you know, whatever legally defined. And I won't just put up the definition according to one law dictionary and not even just two. I'll put up the th legal definitions from three different legal dictionaries. I use uh, Black's, Ballantines, and Bouvier's, and those particular editions are all from the 19th century because I'm trying to go as old as possible. Yeah, and that 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 takes time and effort to do. And I understand that you know there is something to the division of labor and all of that. But if somebody's going to dare shall I say specialize as part of their, if they're going to be a content producer in the alternative media and they're going to specialize in doing legal research, at least in some sense, to some degree, um, you're going to have to invest uh, in, in just, even if it's only in terms of time and effort, in learning how to do this kind of thing. And, and, and by the way, you know, I've occasionally made mistakes in just in trying to make sense of this very confusing garbage that these bar, disgusting bar attorneys have essentially thrown up and, and, try to for, and try to have the cops enforce against the rest of us. Uh, but I do try to, you know, correct for those as soon as I can once I realize something. But, I mean, if anybody ever wondered why the limited government advocates often disagree with each other about things like the federal income tax, for instance, is because they're trying to make sense of legalese when, in fact, sometimes you can't do it. Some yeah. things are so befuddled and so confusing, you literally can't do it. And thus, you're kind of, you, you kind of have to end up looking at other options, whatever those are, one of which would, of course, be Vanu. Yeah, that's 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 definitely true. And although I think one, one yeah, I think one thing to mention here that's that's definitely important is, you know, thanks to the advent of the internet, uh the cost of doing the opportunity cost of doing all these things is much lower uh than than that of political crusading and also, you know, uh you, you consider uh pre-internet. Uh people actually had to, you know, uh trudge on down to the law library and, and find all of these things. So, you know, they might be might have only been able to devote like a you know, a few hours of research uh, on a Saturday. Or actually, no, they aren't even probably open on Saturdays. Like I had to find, you know, time to go in for a couple of hours and, you know, uh, maybe check out books if you can do that and then, you know, focus on that. But, uh, but yeah, the Internet's definitely enabling. I mean, I think it's definitely assisted you in, uh, in, in, a, in a lot of your legal research and the little that I've done. I, I've never even utilized a law library. I've been to one, but I've never actually utilized one. So I think that do that does kind of make the use of legal interstices uh, at least a, a little more possible. Yes, it does. And, and yes, I do, I do rely on using this uh, wonderful internet to, to do most of my legal research. But there, but there are some types of legal documents and, and such that are actually not, that have not been digitized. And so, for example, when I was just starting the Extra Constitutional series, I couldn't find any case law over the internet about uh, driver licensure. So I had to trundle on down to the law library and, and actually grab, you know, the book. I, the, the law library was extremely helpful. Uh, they were actually conspicuously not busy. The place was, was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Really? Oh, really? Gosh, there, was nobody, <laughs> dude, there was nobody there. The librarians were incredibly helpful. I think I've said it in the past before, too. Be always be extra nice to the law librarians, and especially if you're a defendant. And, and you're actually in trouble. You need like access to certain things to like prepare a case. But even if oh yeah, well that's 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 definitely true. That the two time the first time I actually went to look for something, and the second time I was there, and I just like wanted to like go and open a law book just to, just to see what like see what it felt like because it's something I'd never done before. But yeah, both times I went, not a soul in there. That the law librarian position has to be like the easiest job ever. Uh, it's, like cause it, I, I I don't know. I just don't think a lot of people utilize it. No, they don't. And so, you know, you've had your experience with that. And, you know, regarding uh, what happened, at least when I was working on the Right to Travel series, you know, librarian basically, I, I, I said, okay, I'm looking at these specific cases. Here are the citations. You know, it's uh, Southwestern Reporter and, and, and some other ones. 
And she just walked me all through the stacks because my specific references were scattered all over the place. And, you know, she worked with me for like half an hour, dude. I got like free, in a sense, not quite legal assistance, but librarian assistance exclusively. Like I've never had that before. It was very different. I've never had that experience before. Um, but yeah, she helped me you know, grab stuff off, you know, a couple times I had to grab a ladder, go up to like the uh, upper level of the stacks, you know, she had to climb. You'll see that in a lot, a lot of television movies with like library stacks or archives where they have to get a, like a ladder or something to get like the really books like, mm -hmm. no, that literally happened when I was there. So yeah, basically grabbing, you know, books and all that. And then I was just, you know, 20 minutes just scanning over and over and over again. And actually there was interesting, they, as a side note, they also had this machine there where I could email myself the scans. Wow, that, yeah, that's nice, that's nice. Or, or if you had a flash drive, you could plug a flash drive in and then just download the scans, uh, your PDF, the scans directly into it, and I did both. Do they, uh, do they charge you for that? No. They only wow. Charge you, they only charge, well, the particular one I went to, they only charge you if, um, if you actually make photocopies. And I was like, I'm not paying, you know, whatever, whatever the going rate was. If I can just scan, and, you know, this digitally and, and get it to myself or whatever or keep it on me, either way. You can do either one, one or the other or both in terms of emailing versus putting on a flash drive. But I was like, dude, I, I just wanted to make this available to the public, you know, uh, you know, over the Internet and, you know, in PDF format anyway. And they have this device. This, I, I don't want to call it the magic machine. And by the way, folks, this is probably one of the very few times I'm actually going to compliment the government on something, okay? Because the law library was run by the government and financed by taxpayer money. But yeah, they had this like wonder machine in there where, where I could basically just scan stuff and, and, and get it out, essentially. Which was, which was, I've never seen that before, ever. And so, you know, if people need to get access to court cases and all that, again, it might be the law library where you're at may very well be different. But definitely the one I went to, um, Let's, let's just say it was uh, quite user-friendly, and it was just amazing. Like, all I had to do was just show up and ask, I need these court cases, and, and that was that. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, at some point, I would like to go back and, and probably will whenever I have to work on some other uh, article where I need to get original research and the materials are not on the Internet, but I got the citation information. But again, not to go on too long about that, regarding the legal interest I see specifically, you know, sometimes you'll need to do legal research sometimes like from the ground up because there's also other people who claim that they're researchers and then they'll write books or, or they'll have interviews even on mainstream radio or whatever and they don't know what the hell they're talking about i mean just and, 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 and plus i mean in order to actually know a legal interest size exists you've got to actually look at the law mm -hmm. second you have to like actually be able to you know understand the the, the gibber a lot of times gibberish that's uh, that's in these uh and the and these and this legalese uh so uh, you've got to be able to do legal research and uh and, and yeah i mean uh we, we did kind of get to bog down in this a little bit but i do think it's important because uh you're going to need to do uh legal research if you're going to utilize uh, some of these legal interest ICs. yeah and if you're going to actually like use like an actual legal remedy like canceling your voter registration or even that other thing i did which was reclaiming unclaimed property you need to understand the laws that enable you to do that legally so that you're not accidentally either, you know, ticking off a bureaucrat or otherwise maybe even doing some civil disobedience by mistake, because that's actually happened to some other people. You know, I mean, just to use one example of something I do not endorse, you know, Peter Schiff was basically encouraging people, or excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Erwin Schiff was actually encouraging people back in the day to... Uh, use this this so-called method of like the zero return regarding the federal income tax and people got in trouble over it. So just because someone tells you that, oh, you can use this legal interest ice and everything will be fine, um, sometimes you can you can find yourself with, you know, with charges filed and with the cuffs slapped on and all of that, depending how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely, so, definitely. So that's why that's why it's always important. Check out the laws first the relevant laws for whatever possible interstice there may be and verify for yourself that any particular legal remedy that you're thinking about actually using is 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 legally you know a-okay by by the you know by the government itself and i mean that's just the nature of the beast i mean i don't know what else to say other than you know do your own research and don't just believe these gurus who may sometimes actually mean well but who are actually rather naive themselves 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, uh, I mean, yeah, legal research can take a lot of time. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if someone's purely focused on, you know, legal interest, I see, uh, I mean, uh, they, they could get so caught up in exploiting these loopholes that they never move on to Vanu. Uh, which I mean, well, it's, it's 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 almost it's, it's almost like I mean I've talked to to some of these political crusaders like the uh, the uh, anarchist politicians as as bad as that sounds I've I've said it over and over again but uh, but yeah some of these anarchist politicians who say you know I don't actually like fuck I don't I I don't uh, I, this isn't gonna work I'm just using it as you know as a soapbox to like reach more people and uh, and and I've seen a couple of them like actually like slide back into like supporting Trump and uh, it's it's I don't know. They, they, people say that they're they're not going to, you know, this isn't their focus. This is there something that they're doing? And uh, then you know what? Uh, uh, it, it does become uh, uh, what they're doing. And uh, their, their previous, uh, uh, in regards to the anarchist politicians, their previous direct action, uh, or maybe even some Vanu, uh, has is just kind of gone because uh, their focus has shifted into uh, into non advantageous avenues. So. Well, yeah, and I think what you kind of described really makes up the. If not the entirety, at least I think it would be fair to say the majority of the constitutionalist American patriot movement, right? Where they're all getting very, I think, overly focused on legalities, but not so much in the sense of legalities in a practical way, uh, although some of them do, thankfully, at least try to be a little bit more practical about it. Uh, but, but when, 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 they, like, when they should be setting up committees of safety, and would committees of safety be considered a legal interest dice? Either. Huh. Uh, I, think, I think that's an open question at this point. You know, there was actually an article that Gary Hunt wrote a while back, a couple of years ago, which was, um, are committees of safety illegal? And I think the answer that he gave in that article uh, is, is the closest thing to a, to a real answer. But I think at this juncture, that's an open question. Okay, okay. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, man. No, it's fine. It's just that, I don't know, man. Some people can get really bogged down in nuance and minutia and... You know, with some types of legal issues, you can that's that's more apparent than in others, right? So, you know, when it when it comes to well, well actually, hell, I'll just kind of announce this probably for the first time publicly. I'm currently working on uh, on an explanatory article, basically explaining the federal income tax. So everything regarding the IRS and uh, and their lovely history and what they did to Congressman George Hansen, who many people have said he was tortured when his book came out, exposing their corruption and so forth. It's just that sometimes people can get so immersed in legalities and trying to think like a lawyer or how they think a lawyer might think. So it can also get quite speculative at times with no actual legal evidence like case law or, or statutes or, or even constitutions and bills of rights and such that it starts getting into the realm of conspiracizing. You know, or what some people would mm -hmm. call conspiracy theory, and that's that's I think would be a a warning I I would kind of attach to this that if you get yourself too immersed in legal interstices, but really it's more legal research, but it's legal research that doesn't go anywhere, and you're not actually producing an interstice of sorts, or worse, you're producing interstices that don't work, like Irwin Schiff's uh, zero or return. or that. Or that don't exist at all. You just want to see the legal interstices is so bad, you know, confirmation bias and all, that you're actually creating them out of thin air where there's no legal interstice, you know, in existence. Right. And also notice, too, just one parallel example just in passing here, the oxymoronic sovereign citizens, when they uh, file liens against, uh, you know, the bludgies, you know, and, you know, you know, do those liens, do those quote unquote liens, do those actually work? Or look at, you know, some of the fake judges like Bruce Doucette and others, when they have the so-called common law grand juries issuing so-called, um, in you know, what was it, the indictments or whatever that don't go anywhere. And I think that you interviewed Randy England one time to get his kind of take on that. So mm -hmm. th th this is a recurring problem is kind of what I'm getting at. So I think this is just, you know, a lot of what you and I have kind of witnessed, even in recent years, where people kind of may have meant well originally in terms of use, using legal interstices, but then they really kind of, well, abuse it. Let's just be honest and call it for what it is. They really abuse it and then people get in trouble over it. Or if they don't necessarily get in trouble with the government over it, over a misuse of it, at the very least, you have, much like political crusading, increased opportunity costs. So the time and effort that could have gone into other things that would have actually increased one's freedom or one's invulnerability to coercion now is going towards 
reading and reading and reading and reading and reading and then filing paperwork and filing paperwork and filing paperwork and you are no more free than you were today than you were, let's say, if you were doing this like five years ago or pick a time frame. Yeah. Some people literally, Shane, spend their entire lives just obsessed. I, I, there's no kinder way to put it. I've seen this happen even to people I know uh, become obsessed with this kind of thing to the point to, you know, it's, it's almost like a reductio ad absurdum is really what it is. It really does become absurd after a while. So when it comes to interstices, the best way I can figure it is just, it's a rear guard action. It's a fallback. It shouldn't be like the first line of defense. And unfortunately the constitutionalists and other believers in a hypothetically limited government, just that it's like their first and only line of defense. And it's just kind of yeah. sad because when you look at me, I mean, I mean, look at the ideology of most, uh, uh, at least of the political prisoners, at least of the ones that, um, whether it's me or the ones Gary Hunt or even other people have written about. I mean, more often than not, you're looking at, a, at people who hold an ideology that, oh, the government should respect the Constitution or something. And then it's like, okay. And then you decided to, you know, hang your hat on that or otherwise place a little too much faith in that. And then you got in trouble. And, you know, I don't want to blame the victim here, but uh, I think it's important that when you start seeing a pattern and not coincidences, but a provable, at least a correlational pattern, if not a causative one, then maybe you should like reevaluate your strategies and tactics. Just a thought. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I guess just, just my, my kind of couple of closing thoughts here is, yeah, although legal interstices are not Vanu, uh, they can be useful if there is no Vanu method available to solve some issue. We mentioned, you know, having a driver's license and registration. Uh, obviously, that's all personal choice. If you want to, you know, uh, uh, openly, you know, civil defy, uh, op openly civilly disobey the government, that's on you. And I mean, I, I'm not going to, I mean, hey, more more power to you, whatever, whatever. But, uh, uh, but yeah, those are those are legal interstices that, uh, you know, I mean, can, can save you a lot of trouble. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, canceling your voter registration, uh, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. There's there's no risk at all to doing that. I mean, hell, I went into uh, I went into the uh, local county registrar here, uh, into the uh, McLean County Government Center, uh, the belly of the beast, so to speak, and did it. And I didn't get I didn't get tossed in, I didn't get tossed in jail. They just you know did it, and everything was fine. Uh, other ones uh, like gun show loophole. I mean, yeah, with uh, I mean seemingly endless regul more uh, endless continuing regulations against guns. I mean, uh, yeah. For sure, that's 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 actually one of the stable loopholes that you know hasn't gone away and it probably won't go away in the near future either. So, uh, another another very very good one. And then obviously the uh, the necessary legal interstices uh, if you're going to uh, conduct jurisdictional arbitrage uh, or country shopping. So yeah, I mean uh, there are definitely some some good ones there that can be utilized, but they shouldn't they sh you shouldn't be relying upon them because as Rayo said and as we kind of you know explained uh, this evening. Utilizing legal interstices today is based off the interpretation of, of, of laws today, and they do change, uh, as is what happened in Castilla County. So, and I guess one, one kind of final note here is that they, they might actually serve to serve as an inspiration to actually develop further VANU techniques. Uh, so, uh, we mentioned the uh, interstice of protection against self-incrimination, uh, which actually inspired, you know, role-playing police interrogations. Uh, if not security more generally. So uh, even though uh, legal interstices are not VANU, uh, I do think there are some benefits there. But uh, again, we, 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 we definitely discuss a lot of, a lot of the negative things. So, uh, so utilize them when you can, but uh, please don't rely on them. Please don't rely on them. So uh, Kyle, any other closing thoughts, man? I would just say this. Legal interstices would be one way to distinguish uh, between gray and black markets. So yeah, black markets would be your outright illegal activity and your gray markets would either be legal activity, but that, but it's not regulated by, you know, the fourth branch of government, the administrative agencies, or there's just simply a lack of laws uh, regarding a type of activity that hasn't been outlawed. So I think, so I think even for people who are agorists, you know, the legal interstices revolving around certain types of activity can actually uh, make a difference, especially if the certain types of activity are things like dumpster diving, which sometimes are gray market, and other times, as is the case right here uh, within the city limits of Austin, Texas, actually black market, you know, fines up to the tune of like, what was it, $2,000 or thereabouts per offense, so-called. 
So, or or if, if you're if you're an agorist, uh, you know, uh, in uh, you know selling illegal things, and you're driving around without a, a driver's license and registration, uh, that's that's kind of you know like uh, uh, it's, it's almost uh, like falling on your sword, uh, <laughs> kind of. Uh, so so yeah, I. I <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> go, go back to what you were saying, though. Well, obviously, when we, when we do the episode on the ethical enclaves, we'll get deeper into that. But just suffice it for the listeners to understand now, even people who are black market entrepreneurs or who are on that path but not quite there all the way yet, you know, the legal interstices are at least a something you're going to be relying on, even, even if only in terms of your acquiescence. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. I mean, I know a lot of people promote Uber, for example, and if anything, I guess the legal interstices with something like Uber are are kind of palpable, right? At least in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, anything else or, or is that all you got to say, man? I would just say this, you know, when it comes to interstices, I would suggest that maybe some people look at some things that are provable and then verify or, or at least claim to have uh, be successful and then actually look at the laws, do the legal research and just double check and make sure to look for citations too. If somebody says this remedy worked and the justification for it is, for example, like canceling voter registration, uh, Texas election code, you know, whatever in the, the specific numbers, then actually go look it up. And then and and please provide the please provide transparency too, so others can utilize uh, potential legal interstices that you may have found. Right, because obviously uh, those of us who actually do care about freedom or liberty, at least in some sense, uh, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the oxymoronic sovereign citizens who didn't have any transparency, didn't provide any citations with anything, and even the few times when they did, uh, they uh, they were completely misunderstanding what. The had and and even and, mo and some of them even I mean just had nothing to do with what they were claiming it had to do with right so like I mean I've I've already written my articles about you know the so-called sovereign citizens and their copious mistakes and and such but it, it's interesting though that right they were they too were trying to use legal interstices against the government what was unique about them was that they just screwed up very very badly and then they went further and became really obsessive they developed this whole phony ideology that was based on their misunderstandings of what the government's own laws said. So I would say the sovereign citizens are more an example of what not to do. They're more of a, shall I say, a, a series of cautionary tales. <laughs> yep, yep. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, very, very good, Kyle. Very good. So uh, uh, thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Uh, make sure to check out the website, vonnypodcast.com, and also consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes. You could be our first. <laughs> uh, so next week's episode will be titled Political Crusading, Bullshit Libertarianism, Sheep People, and Bullshitters, all terms used by Rayo in his book. It's, it's longer, I know, it's a mouthful, but I find it absolutely hilarious, and I, I think I just kind of have to stick with that as a title. So uh, <laughs> if that changes, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll know next week. So uh, anyways, uh, we'll talk to you soon.